Thank you, John. Uh, it's a great pleasure. It's an honor to be here and to uh, share with you uh, Canada's perspective on innovation agendas, on how to build capacity for a nation in science, technology, and innovation. And being the first, the inaugural Latin American summit is a milestone. And how you take responsibility, the vast majority of this audience from Latin America, in terms of charting out your future and developing a blueprint for the future from this meeting um, is very important. What I want to do is to provide you first with some general comments on uh, innovation, on agendas, um, and to talk about Canada's experience. You are not to copy us. Each nation has to create its own f future based on its value system, its culture, and its assets. And so this is just the Canadian experience, but if it inspires you in any way in terms of charting out your future, then it adds value. Speaking generally for, uh, at the beginning, the objectives of national innovation agendas, we think, are two. First, to create an ecosystem which can foster innovation, s and so as to enhance, to advance economic development or advancement and improve societal well-being for the citizens of a nation. Second, developing strategies with strong consensus support from the different stakeholders, that is government, industry, and academia. And then to implement strategies through programs and initiatives and accompanied by monitoring, due diligence, and accountability uh, are essential or pivotal to assuring success for the na national innovation agenda. Six years ago, Stephen Harper, the Prime Minister of Canada, announced the government strategy called Mobilizing uh, S&T and I to Canada's Advantage. And there are three key elements. Encouraging firms to invest in S&T, to embrace innovation as a competitive strategy. Second, to build on our excellence in institutions and encourage practical application of publicly funded research. Third, talent where people, developing highly skilled people and increasing demand, re receptor capacity for their talent. Um, and so the three pillars then are knowledge, that is build on your research strengths, engineering to generate new discoveries and new inventions, some of which could be of value uh, and add wealth to the nation and to the individuals and companies. People, talent uh, uh, to, are crucial here. Develop and attract to retain highly skilled people. And with those two, develop a major entrepreneurial advantage in terms of translating knowledge into practical applications. And underlying these three pillars were four principles. Excellence is our signature in everything we do. Do not compromise on excellence. Foster partnerships, university industry, government industry, etc. Focus on priorities while at the same time supporting the best ideas ir irrespective of area. We'll come back to that. And enhance accountability. At the end of the strategy, and there, by the way, there's an update that'll be released within two months by the Prime Minister. 
Um, he did a major cabinet shuffle two weeks ago, which has delayed the release of the new strategy, which is a modification, not radical surgery on the old one. <laughs> but what the strategy mandated was to close all the individual advisory bodies across government, like IT advisory body, biotech, etc., etc., to replace the so-called National Science Advisor by the Science, Technology, and Innovation Council. So it was established in October, so almost six years ago. It has sustainability now, <laughs> you could say. Um, I've had the privilege to do this since the beginning. Uh, as John said, it's, very, it's just an amazing responsibility to have it for so long. And there are unique features that I want to convey to you that, aren't, that do not exist in any other advisory council. One, day to day, as chair in the council itself, I deal with the Minister of Industry. Why? Because that minister is responsible for innovation, science, technology across the government of Canada, horizontally. There is a junior minister called the Minister of Science Technology who reports not to cabinet but to the senior minister, the Minister of Industry, and handles certain files like granting agencies. And they work together quite well. What's one unique feature is that any minister, not just the line minister in industry, including the prime minister, comes to this advisory council to ask for advice. Why is that an advantage? Because that means that over half the cabinet is engaged day to day in science, technology, and innovation. They come and ask questions. You provide answers. And because they're asking for advice, they must at least take it seriously into consideration. And consequently, over 80% of the advice given to cabinet through different ministers has been accepted and implemented by the government. That's a remarkable record. I think unprecedented. There are 18 people. They're from all sectors. For example, seven leaders from startups to big companies and in between, uh, three university presidents, one college president, four real researchers, including myself, <clears throat> and three deputy ministers. That's like undersecretary. They're, they're present in a different capacity. They do not participate in working groups that deal with issues. They're there to help pilot the advice that's accepted by cabinet through to legislation and also to network in the government. So the advantages of this setup is first, your membership from outside comes from all over the country, from all different sectors, <clears throat> and we can consult people anywhere in the world in addressing advice. Anywhere. We're now dealing with five pieces of advice from five different ministers. And so we have teleconferences involving people from Sweden, Japan, South Africa, US, Brazil, and so on. So there are extensive networks from the membership, but the deputy ministers give the council the internal perspective and they have their network internally. So that means there's a great buy-in within the government to the work of the council. That was unanticipated as well. <clears throat> so that's our major role. We, we respond to requests by ministers and prime minister. Prime minister gave us several this year already, uh, advice requests, uh, dealing with largely, you'll see, innovation as the driver. Second is our public face. And by the way, the advice is confidential, but once approved by cabinet, 
is of course made public. Huh? Second, our public face is to produce State of the Nation reports benchmarking us on a global basis in STI. And through these mandates, the government can monitor and provide accountability on the national innovation agenda. That is key. I just, before I get into uh, innovation, the State of the Nation report and so on, I've just put on here a few representative examples of the advice we've given. Clinical research. They asked us to provide advice on ethics in human research, modernize it, contracts with companies, how to reduce time to market from discovery to the marketplace, regulatory function and, and other. So when that was provided to cabinet and approved unanimously, the industry minister took responsibility for time to market and contracts. The health minister took responsibility for ethical issues. Big science projects, university business uh, partnerships, procurement, as was re referred to earlier, as I noted, governments buy billions of dollars worth of goods to operate day to day. And we were asked to mod not just to look at innovation, science, technology, to propose modernize, uh, rules for modernization of Canada's procurement policies with an emphasis on stimulating business innovation and particularly with leveling the p playing field not in terms of giving advantage, but giving e fair and equal treatment to SMEs who were frankly disadvantaged in the old procurement policy uh, competing against the giants from across the world, let alone Canada. And I'll show you one policy that's already been implemented very successfully. And then I'll talk about being asked to provide bold new ideas on scholarships. <clears throat> the first thing Prime Minister asked us, in the strategy there were four priority areas which are so general they're almost meaningless. Energy, environment, ICT, and health. And we were asked, tell us, what are the specific themes or sub-priorities in which this government should invest in roughly 30 to 33 percent of the total funding to industry, to university, and so on. And so that's a list. So in ICT, we are very strong in animation and games, Canada, beside winning Academy Awards and so on, and, and other arenas, uh, wireless broadband, and so on. I won't go through all these, but uh, they have made an enormous difference, those investments, to the country. Neuroscience amongst the best in the world now. So in fact, we've been discussing with the United States, the U.S. Brain Initiative, because it converges very well Canada's own emphasis on neuroscience. So that's a brief uh, account of this council. I have served as chair or member of numerous bodies in Canada around the world. There is no committee like this council. People are incredibly committed to it. Why? From billionaires who run many companies to researchers who may have little or no money. Money's not the issue. They see results. They see government acting favorably in most cases and implementing and doing accountability. And when you do that, there is an enormous commitment and dedication by extremely busy people to the cause of serve. Um, a very clever second role that was mandated to us was to do these state of the nation reports. That is, every two years to benchmark us on a global basis, to look at trends, see where we're improving, where we're regressing, identify our strengths and weaknesses, and provide vehicle to engage all partners in the innovation system. 
These are very objective, frank <laughs> reports uh, which have been commented on for, by people around the world as to the strength of these contributions. The latest report, the third, was released May 21, and typically at a national press conference, I bring three members of council with. We have a one-hour press conference with the media and then an information session. And I want to come back to this at the end because one thing that hasn't been discussed so far, how do you communicate to your community and to the grassroots in terms of innovation? How do you engage the grassroots. So we have a very mixed record in terms of in innovation, science, technology. Um, back in February, the head of state, the Governor General of Canada and I co-authored a piece in the number one newspaper, the country, the Globe and Mail, uh, dealing with our international visibility and reputation. And one, uh, I'll just read one sentence. The emergence of a world-class community of researchers and creative minds in Canada is undoubtedly one of our country's greatest achievements of the past 50 years. That's true. That's the good part. The challenge, are, and Chile shares some of these challenges. Knowledge transfer, and business innovation, not enough research in business. First, and I'm going to make some comments with which we feel are very important to any nation's aspirational goals. First, talent base, and the first sentence. Talent is the key competitive differentiator in the global knowledge-based economy. Bar none. Without that, you can talk day and night about other issues. If you don't have the talent, you will never get there. Canada happens to be a country uh, with one of the highest levels or proportions of people who graduate with a degree, number one or two in the world. In the last uh, four years of measurements, in, particularly in terms of science and engineering, the number of uh, degrees granted increased very significantly in science, less in engineering, but still important. But we need to produce more doctoral, PhD graduates. Why? Because doctoral graduates reflect the potential for cutting through breakthrough research and training of new talent. We rank very, um, at a very mediocre level in the OECD, 15th in doctoral degrees granted in science and engineering. 64% of threshold means this report, for the first time of, in the three reports, has set aspirational goals, where we should be five years from now. Five of these, and one is in this arena. <clears throat> we have made a lot of progress as the last bullet says, in the growth of degrees granted, more than most countries, but we have a long ways to go. So basically, we need to increase the production of doctoral graduates to support the creation and application, and commercialization, I would say, of new knowledge. New knowledge is pivotal to the whole ecosystem. Higher education expenditures publicly, that is, government expenditures on publicly funded institutions, were unusual compared to US or uh, Chile or most Latin America. We have no private universities, <laughs> except one little one. And so, uh, we're dealing with publicly funded research and institutions. We're ninth, we're not bad, but we need to, what's happening is other countries like China and so on are just growing much faster than we are. We keep growing, it's not we're cutting budgets, but we need to recover to number three or four. 
I won't show the, go through this. Chile, as you can see, needs uh, capacity building in, in this regard very significantly, even though it's made major thrusts, major advances in the last few years. I, if I draw an analogy, Turkey, never mind the political considerations, in terms of this type of funding has grown tremendously in six years, and the impact is starting to take hold. As I noted, uh, we were asked by uh, the government to come up with new ideas for bold um, programs in human resource-based initiatives, people and talent. And we proposed and the government uh, agreed to establish three new programs. Two of these are scholarships. First, graduate scholarships named after a uh, well-known Canadian, Vanier, postdoc after the discoverer of insulin. And what's, what was a watershed <laughs> was the first one. Because when we submitted it, it wasn't the, the amount of money is phenomenal because these are elite scholarships, 500 a year in all areas. Um, $50,000 tax-free, that's like $72,000 a year for a PhD. What was breakthrough was that foreigners are eligible and in fact apply in competition to Canadians. And we were asked, why do you want to include foreigners? So I held an urgent teleconference and we agreed that we would make the case that foreigners, when they go back to their country, become Canadian ambassadors. They talk about their experience, they interact with others, they may collaborate, they may not collaborate with us. And the government agreed to that. And subsequently, many new programs, not just these, have foreign eligibility, in them, which was unprecedented in the country. Actually, Subar Suresh from NSF asked me to speak about this to the U.S., and the Congress simply will not consider such an, uh, such an option. What I must tell my Chilean colleagues is perhaps this program hasn't been well publicized, but for example, Banting the first year was 24% foreign, the second year 42% foreign. There's not a single application from Chile. Why? We want to collaborate with you. We want to do more with you. And here's a direct entry into getting fantastic support for your best people. And the same applies to Vanier. So it's an opportunity. And Canada Excellence Research Chairs, which are very lucrative for the best So with 0.5% of population, Canada accounts for virtually 4.5% of the total publications, ranks eighth in the world. We rank second in the world in international collaboration. Nearly 50% of papers have people not working in Canada, but outside Canada collaborating with Canadians. And I would argue that is an excellent approach to enhancing innovation because with different, uh, with great diversity. So let's deal with knowledge transfer, commercialization, ultimately. It's vital, of course, to turning discoveries and inventions to uh, new products and processes. But if you compare us to, say, United States, we're inferior in terms of uh, creating, maintaining, and earning income from licenses. We are spinning off less companies now than several years ago. We have a challenge. Key to, one key element to addressing relationships between universities and industry are IP policies referred to uh, earlier, IP policies and as well, IP policies within the industry manifold. So, for research supported by granting agencies, that is um, 
the ownership resides with the institution and the inventors, of course, get a, a royalty. For research with national laboratories involving industry, um, it's owned by NRC, but if you look at the bullet below, if a company funds some or all of the research, then the ownership terms are negotiable. We don't have a nationwide policy, but in reality, the first element defines the policy. That is, granting councils do not retain ownership. And for universities in Canada, and I would argue in many countries, flexibility in working with industry is crucial to benefit both industry and university and to agree on um, the different elements of IP. I want to note th three examples that are truly groundbreaking in the past year on IP, because IP is changing dramatically. I was at the World Economic Forum, participated in a panel on IP, and the views from companies and from universities were really refreshing. Pennsylvania State University last fall no longer mandates ownership of IP associated with industry-funded research. As the VP Research State stated, the real value is not in IP ownership, but rather in the contact students and faculty have with real problems in the world. The university will explore an entirely new approach to make Penn State a friendlier environment for industry-sponsored research. And knowing companies bring a lot of their own IP anyway. We're moving to the position where if a corporation sponsors research, they own it. We prefer it. We're looking for to get the interactions, relationships, and to work on pressing problems of, ben of mutual benefit. Early this year in Canada, University of Manitoba announced an IP policy allowing industry to make use of the research with no strings attached financially until such time as revenue stream begins. Why waste 18 months working out an IP agreement if there's no revenue? You spend a lot of money for working out the IP agreement. So at that point, companies will pay somewhere between 1% and 2%. Sales, re this removes short-term payments, etc., that often are a barrier to successful partnerships. Both those principles are now being adopted both in the U.S. and Canada by a number of institutions. And then from the corporate side, Dow Chemical, I think, has made a very important decision last year, a year and a half ago. They committed basically 25 million over 10 years to 11 institutions, a little less than 25. What's different is the relationship is not based on, it may have been originally based on a, supporting a project. The relationship is with the institution. Part of that relationship involves philanthropy, where the company contributes money to the institution to decide what to do with for best, to best benefit the institution. So such new relationships, rather than on a one project basis, fundamentally alters the relationship between business and universe. And I can tell you two other very big U.S.-based global companies that are about to announce this identical policy. I want to close. Uh, Canada, as, as was noted, has industry-university partnerships has existed since 1982, the, probably the, one of the earliest nations to do that. And it did so by creating new opportunities for that of mutual benefit. And just a few examples quickly. Collaborative R&D. Suppose I get $50,000 from a company per year, just to pick a simple example. I can then apply to the granting agency, Science and Engineering Research Council, for $100,000. It's peer-reviewed. So my $50,000 
as the manager of research for Company X buys $150,000 a year research. Many companies that never engage universities suddenly were participating in this and have since. This is 30 years going. It's not a two-year project. And then there are others, ideas to innovation and in health research, proof of principle, and so on. There are many programs that incentivize industry academy partnerships. In terms of business expenditure and R&D, uh, we're, we're simply moving in the wrong direction. We rank very low, 25 out of 41 OECD economies. But note, in business funding of higher education research, we rank seventh in the world because of those programs in good measure. So we must significantly improve. I won't keep to them. Last, it's important to talk about direct and indirect support by government of research. I hear a lot yesterday, heard a lot, tax credits, tax credits, tax credits. They have value. They're important. They're not the panacea. They're not the solution. We were number one in the world for 20 years in tax credits. That didn't increase research and industry at all. It helped some small and medium enterprises. That was it. So don't get me wrong. They're useful, but they're not the solution. We're number two now to France. Our direct support for, bus for, for business, what does direct support mean? It's not a subsidy. It's support that is based on peer review is amongst the lowest in the world, the lowest being Mexico and Poland, by the way. We're equal to them. United States, as for example, is four to one, direct to indirect. 25 years ago, the United States was four to one, indirect to direct. So it's made a major transformation. The world average is two to one direct support to indirect. All the Nordic countries like Sweden are two to one. And the low level, we firmly believe, the low level of direct support handicaps the competitiveness of Canadian business R&D on a global basis. So last year, the government began a determined path to moved to a better equilibrium and moved half a billion dollars, 4.8 billion is spent on indirect support, way above normal. Moved half a billion dollars to direct programs and, um, and will continue to do that until a proper equilibrium is reached. These are just three examples of direct support programs. In the United States, you have SBIR, small business. That's an excellent program. Another one worth looking at, somewhat different, but some similarities, is IRAP, Industrial Research Assistance Program. Its budget's been increased more than double in the last two years because the government realized the importance. STIC recommended the creation of the Canada Innovation Commercialization Program as part of the pro procurement modernization. It was done on a two-year pilot. It was so successful, the finance minister made it permanent and increased the budget. It's excellent. And then, in certain areas, we have direct support programs like sustainable development technology for clean technologies, for biofuels, that are very significant. So these portfo this portfolio of programs has, will, and is making a great difference. Last, to close, um, I have to put in the SON 2012 quotes, because I've received over 700 unsolicited testimonials from outside Canada, never mind inside. The previous report, I just highlight several. Peter Droll, who is I-20, talked about the impressive report and how it served as an inspiration for the European Union in creating its own report. And a wonderful quote from the German um, State Secretary of Research, this report is the benchmark for measuring the innovation performance of countries 
in an internationally comparable manner. And last, a um, Mexican entrepreneur and the former minister of STI in, in Brazil. I want to close by telling you the profound impact of the report, not only globally, but especially domestically. And it was a brilliant idea by one member of council that made the difference. What he suggested and what has been implemented since the first report is after it's released, but not immediately after, two or three months later, as the report has been digested, numer I did 28 interviews in the first day and a half. <laughs> I was exhausted, I have to tell you. As, it, as it's digested, absorbed into the community, you then in September, so in September we will have six two-hour sessions across the country, Vancouver on the Pacific Coast to Halifax on the Atlantic. And what the idea was, don't do it yourself, partner with chambers of commerce and boards of trade. They bring together all the key stakeholders and communities. So 200 to 400 people. So I remember in Montreal, nurses, princes, school principals, the mayor of the city, entrepreneurs of all kinds and so on. That brings the report and innovation to the grassroots level. That starts a dialogue that has taken over the country in terms of innovation being, as the Prime Minister said, central to Canada's future. That's a, you know, a very strong message. He, he made two statements. Science powers commerce and innovation is key to our future. And that's what we want from decision makers and leaders. And that really helps entrepreneurs, startup companies and others. So in closing, I hope I've demonstrated to you our approach in terms of advice role. It, it is really unique compared to any other nation and why it's unique. And b because of engagement of the decision makers, of politicians around the cabinet table. And second, the impact of this report in terms of anybody in the community, bringing it down to the grassroots. That will ultimately impact future policy creation and development. Thanks a lot.